I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to Purple Roads. My name is Kerry Stinson, and as always, I'm thrilled you're here. This is going to be so much fun. We have, I don't even know where to start with this, a musician, songs, voiceover, I can go on and on and on, and a Texan, which I love. You know I love Texas. Mm -hmm. So we've got Jared Reddick, Bowling for Soup, Chuck E. Cheese, Phineas and Ferb. Jared, how are you? It just goes on and on. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great as well. Yeah, well, that's awesome. I love it. And you've got a podcast that we'll talk about. Man, I, I it's it's a lot. Yeah, as I said, um, you know, sometimes I'll uh, list everything that I have going on, and uh, it it makes my wife anxious. But uh, yeah, and I recently built built out my website, JarrettReddick.com, and even the guy building it was like, okay, this is is there any more? Like, what's happening here? This is a lot. Well, it seems like you like to add these things, though. I like being busy. You know, I um, I don't have really any hobbies. I mean, I'll go out and play golf with my drummer every once in a while or my father-in-law, but, you know, I, I like to create. I like to work. I like writing songs. I like recording music. I, I enjoy making people laugh. So, you know, that that's where the podcasts come in. And uh, so, yeah, I, I just, I, I think that it was just what I was put on earth to do is um, entertain people and um it's again I, I would rather do that than anything else in the world so you know um I, I don't whittle or uh you know I don't play racquetball I just uh I, I, I make up songs and uh and talk like a mouse <laughs> well all right why don't we just why don't we start at the beginning in the aspect of how did you just get into the performing how did you know that was something you wanted to do and where yeah. was the, what was the first aspect of performing for you Really, it was just, um, you know, I, I think I've always been a bit of a ham um, and I got into stand up comedy really early and I, I kind of thought that that would be my avenue. Um, I really didn't, you know, I didn't really get the fever of, of wanting to be in front of he, strangers, you know, until later. But, you know, in, in things that I was in, say football or, or the marching band and things like that, I, I could pretty much hold the crowd of, of people that I knew and and be the funny guy in the room. Um, so I think that's probably where it gets its beginnings is just making those around me laugh or happy or whatever. Uh, and then I got into theater when I was, uh, when I was in high school and I mean, that bug bit me and bit me hard and, and I had started playing music around then too. So around the time I was, I was doing plays and, um, you know, going out on, on commercial calls and things like that. Um, I, I was also playing in a band. And so, um, though I, I actually started out as the drummer, so uh, another sort of thing that happened was I, I really didn't like being back there. You know, I, I, if there's a microphone, my, my tour manager says this all the time, uh, if there's a microphone in the room, I'm going to find a way to get on it, you know, and, and he's not really wrong. I, I do like to, uh, I, I, like I said, I, it's, it's something that making people laugh, making people smile um it's just i somehow it's just in in me i don't know what it is but yeah um i i would definitely say just playing in bands when i was younger and uh and acting yeah it, it's it's fascinating how all that goes what did you play in the band i was a drummer in the band as well so i started playing drums when i was 13 uh and um you know was a drummer in marching band and in that's concert. what i was that's what i was wondering in marching yeah. band you were doing Marching band, I played timpani in the orchestra all through junior high and all through high school. And then, um, and then marching in marching band, I played the snare drum and uh, played, but, and, and, you know, in the bands that I was in, I was behind the drum set uh, until I was about 17. And uh, just as luck, pretty much the way that my life happens, you know, it's just sort of like, it just arranges itself to where our bass player could play drums and we had a friend that played bass, but we couldn't find a singer. So I was just like, I'll try it, you know? And, uh, you know, I never in my life thought that I would be a singer, you know, and here I, here, there I was. And that's, that's, that's what I've been doing ever since. Where does that come from? The, 
and I'm hearing some of your story, but where does the boldness come from that you go, oh, yeah, I'll try singing? Yeah, I don't know. Some people I, are scared to death to do that. You know, it's funny. I, I don't, it, this is what's crazy about me. Uh, and and again, I, I'll throw to my wife again, who knows me better than anybody and will, will say this. There are certain things that I'm just not comfortable with. I don't, like, I'm actually not an outgoing individual. I'm really not. I, I'm, I'm very, I'm pretty reserved. If you don't know me, I'm pretty shy. I don't like returning things at stores or asking for help at a store or anything like that, or talking to the mechanic about what's wrong with my car. Like I, those kind of things, I am just a shell around me and I, you know, whatever. And I'm, ah, you know, and then for some reason, it's just when it comes to, you know, a stage or a, a microphone or, 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 you know, or, or being in some sort of comedy skit or whatever, um, I, I don't even get nervous. Like I, I, it's just something I, I, and I can't really explain it. You know, my, uh, my biological father was a, uh, was a musician and a, and a radio personality and an entertainer. And, you know, my mom, uh, definitely doesn't have a shy bone in her body. So maybe it's hereditary, you know, and, and maybe I'm just a, uh, a product of, of George Carlin. I don't know. It's, it's one or the other. So is there not a, a, because it's this fascinating. Is there not a, a sense of concern of failure? So, you, you know, you get up and sing and if it doesn't work, then you just move mm. to the next thing. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. I think at first there is. Um, and, but what I've managed to do in my career, and if you know Bowling for Soup, uh, you know how I handle things. Um, and so I can mess up a guitar solo in the middle of a show and I'll just stop the show, call myself out on it, and then be like, let the audience vote. Like, should I try it again? You know, and, and we'll go from there. Um, and so really, I think less than worrying about failing, I more embrace the fact that failure is going to happen and, and just incorporate that into things. I mean, obviously, I have, uh, you know, done things on stage that I'm embarrassed about. You know, I... Um, one time in front of a lot of people, I was playing, but I couldn't hear myself. And I started singing a song in the, a step off, but I couldn't hear that I was off. So I sang a whole song completely out of key. And I, I was the only one that didn't know. So those kind of things are embarrassing to me, but they're so few and far between that, you know, you can't, um, again, I find most of the time I find hiccups and, and by hiccup, I mean like some sort of a, a stumble in something I'm doing. I can find the comedy in it. And I've been able to do that really since I was a kid. Well, yeah, it's fascinating because I've met people in this business that are perfectionists mm -hmm. and it really doesn't work. Yeah. It, it, it really, it really, it really is hard to do that. If, if yeah. you can't, you know, I don't want to say laugh at yourself, but understand that we're all going to make mistakes and, sure. and just, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Even from a perfectionist standpoint, I like things to be good. I mean, I, I think a lot of people would say, that Bowling for Soup doesn't take ourselves very serious. It's actually the opposite. We take ourselves serious. We're just not a serious band. I'm not a serious performer. Um, and so I think, you know, with all of that, for me, it's like even like recording and things like that, where so many artists get held up on, oh, this isn't good enough. We got to do it again. We got to do it again. We got to, to me, a lot of times that takes the feeling out of it. It takes the, the, you know, the organicness or the natural aspect of what it is you're doing out of it. And, and I'm the same way with voiceover too. Like, I, I, and, and, you know, singing to me, sometimes the imperfect performances are the bet are better because it has a personality to it. You know, once you sit there and you do something over and over and over again, you become, to, you start to sound like a robot, not always, but a lot of times that translates that way. Um, and that's the way that we hear it. So, you know, I, I'm really good about it. I think this turn is to my detriment as well, though, but, uh, but I am good at going, Hey, that's good enough. I'm putting that away. The problem is, is that like, let's say somebody's like, okay, but we want to change this one thing or this one word or whatever. I'm like, ah, I already did that. You know, like I've, I want to move on to the next thing. Um, and so herein lies the, you know, the issue with me being a little bit relaxed in, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, I, I would say that I'm, I'm definitely not a perfectionist, but I, 
I, uh, I want to make a good quality product, no matter how silly it is what I'm doing. Well, you know, it's interesting. I've been a fan of Bowling Pursuit for a long time and, and I love your work and across the board, what I, I, I feel about it. And I think why I love it so much is because it's fun. Yeah. It's just yeah. absolutely fun. The, the, you know, I've been singing Ohio, come back to Texas for a long time <laughs> yeah. in 1985 yeah, and all that. Yeah. They have energy. They feel authentic meeting you, meeting you here. It feels like what I hear from the music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and same with these other projects that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Where does that come from? It, it seems like it's almost a goal of you all to have fun in that the energy and the positivity of it. Band started and um, we realized quickly that part of our show, I mean, we started in 94. We realized that part of our show was a, was a was a different side of things than just the music as far, our performance is very there's a lot of ad lib there's a lot of comedy involved in it there's just a lot of uh, talking about our day or messing with each other or this and this and this and to me that's that found its way into the music and for us as a as a group it's all the rule it's there's been one rule ever it's like when this isn't fun anymore we'll stop doing it and when it when it got to be tough for us and you know around 2012, 2013, you know, there's a lot of things happening in our lives that made it difficult. Uh, we took a break and it's the best thing we ever did because when we came back, we're firing on all cylinders and we're back again. But, you know, I, I, I very rarely am in, a, am in a state of mind to not write fun songs. Again, during that time, we made a record called Lunch Drunk Love and I was going through, you know, a lot of personal stuff and so was our bass player. And so that record, kind of isn't as happy and so it sort of just shows itself you know it shows like okay well they're they're human beings as well and um our our fan base got it because you know everybody has bad days but for the most part we like being that band that when you've had a tough day at work you come home and you put on a bowling for soup album and you just smile and right. you, you know, it can it can take you know a breakup or a bad day or an argument with your boss and because our songs include all of that stuff and it sort of makes it and it twists it to be like, you know, ah, maybe it's not that bad. Yeah, I've always been curious about this as you're talking about the album and when you were going through a tough time. Is it is it is it like therapy basically to write about things that you're going through? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. So, you know, as I said, I'm not re I'm, I, and, and it took me a while to be able to put um, like actual you know, meaning into lyrics. So if you listen to early Bowling for Soup records, you, you people will go, is this real? And I'll be like, it's kind of real, but really it's just, I just thought about this girl in high school and I just made up the story, you know? Whereas now when you hear something for the most part, it's usually based upon either reality or loosely on a situation or whatever. Um, so the answer to your question is yes. It took a while to get there. Um, it took a while for me as far as like a, a songwriter to be able to put that part of myself out there. Um, and this sounds funny coming from a guy that writes silly songs most of the time. Um, and I get that, but quite frankly, there's, there's a depth to what I do uh, that you probably don't hear unless you need it. And that's what I found is, is the best connection that I can have with Bowling Your Soup fans is like when, I write something and they're like, oh, okay, well, wait a minute. This is what he meant there. Like, okay, yeah, this is, the dude's been through some stuff, you know? And, uh, but yeah, it, it's definitely a therapeutic thing to be able to put it into the world. And more, I think, equally as therapeutic for people to react to it. Well, and it probably brings a, a closer connection yes. between you and the fans. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's key. And, uh, you know, again, one of those things that I think keeps our fan base so loyal, um, you know, through all these 27 years in and, uh, you know, doing bigger shows than we ever have, um, you know, that definitely shows a loyalty. And I think a lot of that is, as you said, you know, you don't know me, but if you meet me and you've heard the the songs you kind of will walk up to me and go oh you're like just that guy you know like that's who you are you know right. you hear me singing and talking on the albums and that's just who I am I I write like I talk which is probably a compliment 
Yeah, 100%. Well, I, you know, I definitely don't, none of my guys, you know, we don't, we never have, no, you're kind of not allowed to have an ego in this band. You can't put on face. Like, you know, I have bad days just like anybody, but I also understand that if you're going to approach me at Starbucks, that it took at least something inside you to kick you in the butt and make you come up to me and talk to me. I would never make you feel like that was a bad decision because I hear too many horror stories about that. So regardless of how I feel or what is going on, you're getting, you know, as, as, as up as I can possibly be, that's what you're going to get, you know? And, uh, and I'm aware of that. And, you know, quite frankly, I've met people who are famous um, that I think probably could take that advice as well. You know, like I said, everybody has bad days, but I think it's important that, you know, someone who, I, I just, I think it's important that when you put yourself out there, you give your best self all the time, you know, and, um, you know, quite frankly, I know that that's very difficult for some people too. No, I, I love that. It, it, I've, I've gone through that. And I was 23 years old when I started doing Barney. And one of the first things I did, they took me to a hospital and I saw all these six kids, six kids and these things. And I learned very quickly at that age, the responsibility of that, just, just what you're saying yeah. that they didn't come in my case, you know, they didn't come to see me. And so I can't be sad or, you know, yes, I'm a human being and all that stuff, but that's something I, I got to deal with before or after. Yeah. But when you're there, you know, you're there to be that up and positive person. So I, lo I love you saying that because uh, it can be hard. And I, I get that, you know, if you've had a long day or a bad day or those things, but it really yeah. is important for someone that's so excited to see you. You're so right. And I think the hospital thing puts it into perspective. I mean, I've done a lot of that, you know, obviously more back in the day when, when we are, our, our songs were huge and right you know um and I, I try not to ever say no to anything like that that I can possibly do and you know it's a it, it is good perspective it is like you know and and to me I think any sort of appearance like that where you're you know uh, you know we've done several make a wish things and and those you know where you're just like man I mean this person you know, the smile on their face is because of this thing that I create or this thing that I do or this thing that I said, you know, like, man, I need to check myself. Like I, I just stubbed my toe today, you know, or I've got road rage, you know, it's like, um, it, those things do help to put that in perspective. And, and, you know, that's the extreme obviously, but again, right. I, I am, I try and be, you know, again, I'm not, going to go out of my way to you know like I said in a restaurant to make myself seen right uh so I'm not there to be noticed but once you notice if you if you do notice me and you want to come up and say something or have a photo with me you will get the absolute 100 percent best treatment possible <laughs> you know that's because I've gone through the make issues as well and it's the most unbelievable experience but you yeah. also remember I toured for five years with Barney and it's, mm -hmm. you know, sold out audiences every night and you realize what it took for them to get there. Right. Yeah. The kids got up at five in the morning and mm -hmm. woke their parents up and all that stuff. And for you, you know, it's a lot to get to a show and to go do those things. Yeah. And uh, it's worth every dime for a fan. If, if the people that, you know, you go see yeah. are, are like that, you know, 100%. Absolutely. But I love that. I'm curious, uh, where'd the songwriting come from? Well, the songwriting, I think, comes from, uh, you know, riding in the car with my parents uh, as as a kid. You know, I mean, I'm I'm 49, so we didn't have Walkman or, or you know, or a way to escape. What you listen to is what they played in the front seat. Uh, and so that was a lot of bands that wrote amazing stories and amazing songs. The Eagles, Willie Nelson, Kenny Rogers, Dolly Parton, Neil Diamond. Um, you know, and then even into like Donna Summer and, and the Supremes and things like that. And so that was the soundtrack to, cause you know, we couldn't really afford to fly. And so we were in the car a lot, a lot. And my grandparents lived an hour and a half away and we visited them quite often. And so I think that's the basis of it all. Um, and then when I discovered music, you know, again, I was a drummer and really I, I put the pressure on everybody else to write songs. I really didn't know I didn't know how to do it. I didn't play like an actual guitar or musical instrument. So I, when I picked up a guitar, uh, finally, at, I guess I was probably 19. Uh, I picked it up to write songs. I didn't know how to play it. So I'm completely self-taught. 
And I started writing songs the day I started learning how to play the guitar. And the way I write um, is, like I said, back into those old country ways and, and their stories. And I like, I like there to be a beginning and an end. And I like there to be a turn in there that, you know, sort of makes it to where it's like, oh, I see what you did, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it wasn't something that um, I didn't have any of that around me as a kid or anything like that. I, I wasn't exposed to it. It, it was just really... Um, you know, well, like I said, I, I found my biological father or I, or who he was anyway, um, you know, a few years ago, and turns out he was a songwriter when he was a kid. And, and, uh, so, you know, maybe, maybe there's something to be said for, again, uh, nurture and nature. So I, it was, it was fun. I got to tell my stepdaughter that you were going to be on. Yeah. I had been hearing Phineas and Ferb's theme song. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah. All week, we, yeah. you just mentioned it, and she sings the whole thing. Yeah, um, it's it's uh, it's probably one of the greatest theme songs of all time, you know. <laughs> and uh, I'm very very lucky to have been a part of that whole thing. So where does that come from? Yeah, um, Phineas and Ferb is you know my again as I said earlier, my life tends to just sort of work itself out. Um, but uh, Dan Pavenmeyer, Swampy Marsh created that show on a napkin in a restaurant <laughs> both of those guys um had been writers on the simpsons together okay and in the simpsons writer room bowling for soup was a very popular band and dan was a was a huge fan well dan went on to be one of the original directors and animators on family guy and then swampy created mock Ro uh, rocco's modern life and uh they came back together to start this phineas and ferb well this song was written and again, I had the job before I ever even knew it. Like they were like, okay, you know, they're in their meetings with Disney and it's like, hey, here's this theme song and we want Jarrett Reddick from Bowling for Soup to sing it, you know. Um, but little did I know it would go deep, dig deeper than that because eventually they wanted the people, the Disney was like, okay, where's the rest of the song? And they're like, oh no, there's no rest of the song. This is what we have. And so they brought me in and said, hey, here's the theme. We want you to sing it. But can you turn this into like a three minute song? You know, and I'm like, sure. Yeah, that's not a problem. So um, I did. And, um, but, and while I was there, I got to read for a part on the show. I read for the part of Swampy, the drummer for Love Handle, but I actually got cast as Danny, the singer for Love Handle, which is great. Cause I got lines and, you know, pretty much every season. And uh, you know, it, it ended up being great. They, they, um, after that, you know, we had a relationship and, I had an open door policy the whole time that the show was going on. I could go in and write a song every time I was in LA. So I got to write like Izzy's got the frizzies and um, you know, several other songs for the, for the thing I, I wrote um, with them. I wrote robot riot, which is, in my, my, I got to write and sing robot riot, which is actually, you know, love handle actually performs in the movie. And so just great experiences all around there with those guys and, and such a smart, smart, smart television show. I, I think, it's one of the things that I'm most proud of, and it has nothing to do with me, is that, you know, my friends will be like, oh, my God, that's like the only show that my kids watch that I can actually stand, you know, like it's actually funny and the music is good. And I'll always be like, yeah, you know, that's how it was designed, you know, and but I had zero to do with that at all. <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny. I, obviously, I've been in this industry a long time. And doing this show, I've had all kinds of people from children's TV and anime and all of that. And it's really interesting. We've got a 15 and a 17 year old here. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting what they connect to and what they don't connect. They actually weren't yeah. Bernie fans, funny enough. Yeah, um, that's pretty late. That's pretty <laughs> late for them, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a little late. Yes. Yeah. Well, my, my daughter is 18 and we did the Barney videos. I mean, it's like we did the... Um, me and my teddy getting all ready. So that, that, that video that that one was on, man, we watched that a lot, but uh, yeah, my son is 15 and never, yeah, that it's, he really wasn't a TV kid, but I see what you're saying. I think it's funny. And that, but that song, I mean, the second I mentioned you and I mentioned Finney, she just, yeah. Da -da 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 and just kept going. And yeah. every time I see her, I'm like, yeah, today it's, da -da -da -da. <laughs> it, it, it just yeah. meant something to her and her, her yeah. mother smiled about it. What, cause I, this is just fascinating to me that mm -hmm. 
you you give it a little piece. <laughs> Can you do three minutes? You're like, sure. Yeah. And it turns into what it, it turns into. Yeah. I mean, it, the biggest show in the world for nine years. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I was able to, the, it's crazy. I wrote the full length song and, and so, uh, and then they ended up animating that whole song into one episode and Bowling for Soup is actually in there playing the song. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's crazy. You know, again, relationships and opportunity are just one of those things where you've got to get in there and mean it. And I almost didn't go to that meeting. I was, I'd actually been really, <laughs> I was out really late the night before uh, in LA. And um, quite frankly, I, I had done Jimmy Neutron, the theme song to Jimmy Neutron, the movie. And I had been to a ton of these meetings. Like I'd been to, been to all of these things and I've tried and I've written this and I've written that and I've written that. And I, I was just kind of like, okay, you know, I've got a new record coming out. I think I just want to chill. Like, I don't, I don't even know. My manager was like, the car is there, get in the car right now. And I am so glad I did because, you know, Dan and Swampy and then Jay Stutler, who is the head of, or I, I think he's higher up now, but he was head of uh, animation music at the time. Just such a kind soul and all of them are just such great people I, I, I'm so glad that I got to meet them and have them you know and have them in my life now uh, but also just to be a part of the whole thing you know I mean you, you just never know this is a great you know you're interested in this kind of thing this is this is one of the things that I when I tell people this it's it makes it make sense when I went in for this meeting they shared an office about the size of you know like maybe a 10 by 10 and they were like desks up against each other and they had one secretary and so they um that you know there's like one poster coming this spring or whatever the next time i went in there they had half that floor the next time i went in there they had moved them to another floor because they had a whole floor and then two years later they had to build an entire building for them like that's how big that show was i mean you know obviously with barney like it's the thing where i would go in and i, I would like I remember when they got macaroni and cheese and I'm just like, guys, you got mac and cheese. Like this is as big as it gets. And then the, but the biggest one to me was I go, you're on band-aids. Like that is as big as it gets. You don't get any bigger than band-aids, you know? And uh, they were like, we can't believe it. We're on band-aids, you know? And so, um, you know, I, don't, I think people put that in perspective. Like if you get a fruit snack or mac and cheese or band-aids, like that's as big as it gets. That's it. That's yeah, no, obviously we saw it. You know, I, you know, the creators of Barney were school teachers, and yeah, and you know, we were doing. I was doing birthday parties back in the early day before yeah. we were on TV, and it's amazing to see that all of a sudden, you know, TV, and then all these people were showing up, and, and we had band aids too. So I understand how big, the yeah, big of the deal yeah. That was. I used to own a toy store actually when I was a kid. So when I was seventeen, I had a toy store, and uh, I'll never forget when Talking Barney came out. It was like the hot toy that year. And I mean, it was like the Cabbage Patch Kid of that year where like people were fighting over it and stuff. It was nuts. But uh, anyway, that's my Barney connection. Where, where did the toy store come from? So that was in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas. I, my girlfriend's dad had this little thing that he was just doing for fun on the weekends. And I uh, it was just, you know, selling bicycles and skateboards. And I got into it with him and, and we ended up opening up a store and had it for several years, you know, until... Um, pretty much Nintendo kind of put us out of business. It was like kids really didn't want skateboards and bikes for a few years and uh, electronics. You, you can't really compete as a mom and pop in that world, you know, as, as most people would, would understand the category killers just come in and just, you know, they sell Walmart will come in and sell all the games at cost and then make $10 on the machine. And they're fine with all of that. You know, you can't really right. exist, but, but yeah, that's a whole different lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many places to go here, i know i know it's great I, I absolutely well because it's fascinating to me with this business the kind of the two things are you, you kind of have to do like you've done which is is jump out there um because it, it's just kind of hard to find your way and then you also have to be very flexible which you've done as well going mm -hmm. bowling the soup and and these different things you've done had yeah. you done voiceover before phineas and ferb or was that the first one um, I had done a few things. Yeah. I, um, I had done a few commercials and things like that. And I knew that I had flexibility with my voice just because just for acting and stuff. Um, so, 
I knew that it was a world that I that would um, that would suit me. And as at the time when Phineas and Ferb came out, voiceover was still kind of the un, unexplored territory. So A-listers really didn't want to touch it. So when I got Phineas and Ferb and I started to go on other reads, like I actually had a chance at jobs. And then as the world began to change and, you know, the stigma of voiceover kind of changed with, you know, Jack Black and, and some of these A-listers starting to do movies, um, just the scope of the business changed really, really rapidly. And so all of a sudden I'm up against Jack Black or Charlie Day or people who have the same sort of flexibility and highness to their voice that I had. And uh, so I got, I got pretty tired of it really quick and was pretty much done. Um, in fact, I had, I had an agent and then I just, I didn't want an agent anymore. So I got out of that. And then, um, yeah, that's when Chucky came calling. And uh, just like I said, it's very, very strange how things line up. Well, and that, that's the perfect segue to this because I definitely want to talk a lot about, about Chuck E. Cheese. You know, that thing's, that Chucky's been around since 77. And I, yeah. you know, was it Showbiz Pizza at one point? And yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a crazy story in that, uh, you know, Showbiz and Chucky actually were, were competitors and showbiz actually won the fight but liked the mascot better so showbiz actually bought Chuck E. cheese and then adopted chucky as the mascot so showbiz's guy was the, they were the pizza time theater and it was uh, billy bob because he was like a big bear and that's what we had in my hometown and then my grandparents had Chuck E. cheese so i, I had both of them in my life as a kid uh, but yeah Chuck E. cheese to me historically a lot of nostalgia there for me i mean it, it's pretty crazy the tie in. I mean, I went there all the time when I spent the summers with my grandma or spring break or whatever. Um, we used to have our victory parties there uh, in eighth grade for football. And then Bowling for Soup filmed our very first music video in a Chuck E. Cheese. And, you know, that's many, many years before there would be any sort of inkling of me being him, you know. So, uh, life's weird you know it's super weird well it is and you probably i don't know if you know that we have a huge connection here so many of the barney people yeah were involved in it bob west was pasquale who original mm -hmm. voice of barney uh duncan was yep. there doing for you uh, yes. Stephen white one of our writers was involved in that um I, it seems like when i was doing my early days of promotion for barney i always ran to chuck e cheese because we were both in texas all over all these events. Sure. Yeah, so there's this huge connection here. Um, and I know Eric Neal, I'm very good friends with Eric. Yeah, Neal yeah, yeah, totally. Eric's good dude. He's awesome. He's awesome. So, what is it like when, they, when you get a phone call about being Chuck E. Cheese? Man, I mean, so the way that it went down was I got a call, a friend of a friend. He just he basically called me and he said, Hey, this is crazy random, but what do you think about the opportunity of being Chuck E. Cheese? Now, this guy has nothing to do with entertainment and, and none of, I, so it was just one of those things where I'm just like, okay. But I mean, he's tied in enough to the world where I was like, I guess this is serious, you know? Well, it turns out that his next door neighbor knew that he knew me, gauged my interest. His next door neighbor is named Bill Cochran. And Bill Cochran worked for Richard's Group, uh, which is a huge advertising agency here in Dallas at the time. And Bill got the account um, to revamp Chuck E. Cheese and to literally just take it. And it was time for, to redo him. You know, he'd been, I think, you know, I, I don't know the specifics of this, but I know Duncan had been him for like 20 years. I don't think they had really changed the mascot in a long time. You know, right. I think it was just a nice, let's modernize this, this guy. Um, and so little did I know, but this was all was happening because Bill had seen me do improv comedy and liked my band and knew that I had the flexibility with my voice. He knew that I could sing. He knew how I sang and all this. And so this mouse is sort of being built with my mannerisms, like how he plays the guitar and all this. And I have no idea this is going on. They made a reel of me in interviews and me doing these random things off the internet and pitched me to Chuck E. Cheese I still have no idea any of this is going on. <laughs> so the first time I set eyes on any of these folks, I knew Bill from, from improv comedy, but I didn't know right. what he did outside of that. And so my first time in, I go in and I'm like, uh, yeah, hey, you know, I, I, 
and they're like, yeah, jump in the studio. Let's go. Me and my manager think I'm in my audition. Right. So I go in and I, I'm like, they're like, well, how do you think he would say this? And, you know, you know, from this world, it took me, it took me about a year to really get him down, like what he's going to say and when, and now they don't even really, they don't even really direct me all that much anymore. It's like, you know, how he's going to say it, but back then I'm still trying to figure out what his voice is and where it, where it sits here, you know, and, and all right. that. And, um, so I am walking out of the room after it's over and they're like, Hey, thanks. Yeah. We'll need you back in about three months. Uh, we'll cut the winter show. And I'm like, all right. And I've got a text from a manager to call me after the audition. I call him and I go, uh, Hey man. And he's like, Hey, how was the audition? I go, well, I don't think I auditioned. I think I just cut commercials actually. And, uh, I'm pretty sure I just did the first show in the restaurant. He's like, we don't even have a contract yet. I'm like, I know. I don't know what's happening here, but that's true. That was in May and we didn't actually, uh, you know, I wasn't actually signed on to be him until July of that year. So uh, it was very, very quick, very weird. Um, and again, I had been sold to the company just based upon my personality um, in interviews and, and my, my voice, the way that I sing. It's fascinating. Well, I've I've seen all this craziness over over the years on a lot of how this this goes down, and I've seen yeah. that part as well. Um, we went Bernie went through several different voices when Bob left, and then they had to replace. So I have seen that aspect of it as well. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of fascinating where it goes through, and and in fact that happened with us when I was doing the TV show. They brought someone new in. And I had no idea. I started hearing these rumors like, is there someone else coming? They're like, yeah, yeah. we haven't introduced you yet, but we're bringing someone else in. So some right. of that craziness does happen. Yeah. And on that point, do you do you go back at all and, and listen to the others? Do you watch what they've done or do you just come in with totally something? No, new? I came in just totally new. I mean, I knew enough about you know, Chucky and like the way that he had sounded for several years and sort of like his accent and all of that. Um, but, you know, it, this was all just new and they really wanted me to make it my own. And I, I don't know, you know, again, I, I didn't know Duncan and I, I don't know, you know, any of the, sure, how sure. all of that stuff in the background worked. I don't know any of that stuff. I, in fact, I didn't even know that it was going on until, as you know, there's a very, uh, uh, a very excitable fan base for Chuck E. Cheese and probably I'm thinking Barney as well. So yeah. when there are changes or whatever, they definitely make things known. And so until the, all of that really started to stir up and, you know, uh, people sort of kind of pick sides or whatever, um, which I, nobody really ever said anything bad about me. It was more just like, well, we like him. He's great. We just, you know, what happened to the other guy? You know, that kind right. of thing. But I, um, no, I, I came in and uh, I sort of already had a vision of, how I wanted him to sing, which is just me, right. you know, but with like a little bit, I mean, originally it was, so again, it's been nine years. So nine years ago, the songs, it sounded a little bit more like me singing. Now his, his voice is a little bit higher. Um, and then the way that he talks is, is just what my best friend calls my people voice. It's like, if you were walking, if I know you and you walk in the room, I'm like, Hey, what's going on? And that's just basically Chuck E. Cheese, you know? Right. Um, so, uh, but no, it, they, they were, they were amazing. And, and, you know, the, the first couple of things that we did really kind of gave me a chance to find his flexibility and his personality, because the, the first things that we did were like super excited, like every kid's a winner and, and these kind of things like that. But then they started doing these commercials where they were like talking to the moms of like, Hey, you know, this thing, this thing that you're doing for your kids is really cool. It's cool that you bring them here. And so I got to do this toned down sort of thing about him, with him. And that really, it's funny when I hear actors talk like this, because I'm usually going, what are you talking about? But that's really when he became real to me, where I was just like, okay, this is what he would say and how he would say it in this particular situation. And so that when you hear actors talking like this, it really is real. I, I didn't, I always thought it was, you know, they were making stuff up as well, but you know, he, he exists to me and the way that he says things, he reads things. And uh, Matt Daniel, who is uh, the creative guy at, at Chuck E. Cheese, who's Eric's, you know, buddy, and they, they write the songs and stuff. He more often than not, he will sit back and go, how would Chuck E. say this? And I'll do it. And he'll go, yep, you're right. And so, um, 
yeah, it's been great. And I, I just love it. And the, the nostalgic aspect of it is, uh, you know, again, it's, 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 it's literally like a dream come true. Well, first of all, I totally understand the, the, the fan base and how, how they go with those yeah. things. But I yeah. got to think you had, with the Phineas and Ferb, that had to give you a lot of street cred coming, coming in. Yeah, I had the street cred coming in for sure. And, that, and, you know, the fact that I was actually already a bona fide rock star, you know, in right. their eyes and stuff. I mean, that was cool. Again, I didn't read anything negative about me. It was more of just like, why are they changing? Or like what sure. we like, or, you know, and I definitely see the, I like the old guy better. Or, you know, sure. I think Bob, like Bob was the best or Duncan's right. the best or you're the best. And honestly, everything is uh, is a progression to whatever's next. You know, I'm not, I mean, one of these days I won't even be on the planet. So somebody else will be Chuck E. Cheese. And, you know, you can only hope that that I've added something you know, to the, to the character, to, uh, to the fans and to the, you know, to the lives of these kids that, that really like to go there and, and see this guy dance and give out tickets. You know, I, I, uh, I don't take it for granted. I'm, I'm super, again, we talked a little bit earlier about just the responsibility of even yeah. just walking down the street. I mean, I get what my responsibility when I'm the mouse, you know, what, what that is and, and with that, within what realm I can operate. I've talked to Eric about this before and and we've talked about it with Barney, you know, Barney really only was entertaining kids, uh, little kids that, that we, we never really went for the adult audience, right? It was really just for the kids. Um, and then there's other kids shows like Sesame Street that do a little bit of both. And so you guys are doing that as, as well. Is that uh, the balance of, of that? Not to go yeah. too adult, but not to be so kid all the because you know the parents are obviously going with the kids to yeah. see these things and all that. Where is that balance? Um, I think it's super important, and to me that comes into you know Eric and Matt and just the smartness of what it is they write. Um, you know, Matt writes most of the skits, and he and Eric work on the songs together. And there's a couple of other writers. Um, you know. Uh, it's just smartly written in that it's engaging for kids and entertaining for adults. And again, that sort of goes back to that whole Phineas and Ferb thing to where, um, you know, I think that there's aspects of things to where you're in some sort of situation where there's a mascot or there's somebody that's talking to you that could kind of get in your ears and, and sort of drive you crazy. And I feel like they've done a really good job of, Chucky not being that way uh, and I'm not saying that he ever was I'm just saying that when I go in there like it can be sort of in the background if you want it to be or you can pay attention to it if you want to and you know it's it's not like you know I, again I don't feel like parents go in there just going oh my gosh I've got to hear it you know sit through this um, and you know if you sit down and you watch the skits if you watch the YouTube things they are they're entertaining I mean, we did uh, on Fridays we did live streams through the whole you know through that part of the pandemic when that was what was happening and the restaurants weren't open and all of that. And, um, you know, they, they, uh, they, they made them very, very, you know, they made it to where adults would really just want to sit down and watch it with their kids. And I think that that's, that's important. That's what we're doing these days. Right. We're, uh, we're, we're trying to be engaged with our children. Right. They are. I, lo I love that. I love that. So the podcast, Mm -hmm. we're going to another area of yeah, 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 we're totally. what we can here right yeah i mean so i i have a friend of mine um uh a friend of mine got was that, that i met through my wife's dad actually um was just a big podcast fan and you know it was before i even listened to podcasts and he would just listen to me talk and all the time just go you've got to have a podcast you've got to have a podcast like, okay well i have one he's like no 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 I have a Bowling Pursuit podcast that I would just do like every six months or whatever. He could, not like that. Like you need to do one where you're, you do it every week and here's the thing. So you need a theme. And anyway, this is, his name's Rich. He was the original co-host. Um, he came up with Jarrett Goes to the Movies and uh, we started doing it six years ago with three, almost 300 episodes in. Nice. And uh, essentially we, we watch a movie and we talk about it, but it's, there's the cast is five people my wife um our friend amy our friend eric uh sean the producer and myself is that six people one two three four i don't know anyway that's how many people it is right 
And, um, you know, a lot of times we just get off on tangents and talking about our lives and talking about this or our kids and stuff like that. So it really has grown into its own thing. There's a movie associated with it, but you don't necessarily have to have watched the movie to be there. Uh, and then actually my most successful podcast, uh, I started a couple of years ago with my drummer. We were in, uh, in his mom's swimming pool, sitting there having a drink and talking, and we were talking about our kids. And uh, we looked at one another and just like, you know, this is a show. You know, this is, we could, with just our friend group, we could just get people on and talk about something that they don't normally get to talk about. Right. People don't get, especially actors and rock stars and things like that, asking about their kids really isn't a thing. So let's get people and get them on here talking about parenting and talking about, you know, just what it's like raising kids in this and, and through the pandemic and all this. So um, Rockstar Dad's been going strong now and uh, listenership is out the, it's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's another weekly one that we do. And, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, I, I like it. I like the podcast thing. It's, it, you get used to it. You know, you just sort of talking to nobody, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, but yeah, I, I kind of got asked to do one and the reaction was pretty big and I thought, oh, maybe I'll try and, and next thing you know, and it, it's fascinating and it's, yeah. um, you meet new people and you learn things, which right. I just love that. And I love the connection. I, I love meeting people and having the, you know, as we're talking about the, the, you know, the responsibility and, and all of those things. I think it's really cool when you realize that other people have gone through the same experience. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a really cool, and you know, it's, it allows me to open up another window into, you know, me, I'm pretty open, you know, I, I, um, most of the things outside of, you know, Phineas and Chuck E. Cheese can, you know, are, are usually not that safe for little kids. Right. Um, but you know, that's, that's what that is. You know, that's, that's who I am. And, and, you know, that's what we get to talking about. And that, that's the audience that that's listening to us. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a nice little outlet and, uh, and honestly, just another reason for my drummer and I to hang out because <laughs> we pretty much are together. You know, it's, if we're not, so when we're touring, we're roommates, we're always together. And then when we're on the road, we're playing golf or meeting. And so it's just one other reason for us to spend two hours a week together. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I love, I love, I have, I do a, a show for Patreon with a buddy of mine from the Barney tour. And we talk about what it was like touring and all that stuff. And it's kind yeah. of the same thing for us. We, we, we love telling the old stories. So sure. Fun. Yeah. That's just it. You know, it's, it's the hardship stories too. You know, I love telling stories from the road, like before things got good. You know, I tell, I tell this all the time. It's like uh, the war stories that come up are almost always pre tour bus, pre hit, you know, it just because you're out there and, you know, just absolutely under the, you know, in the elements and, and surviving, you know, right. and I'm sure that's what it was like the early day of those tours, you know, too, just, you know, we just got to get from city to city and, and pull this off. That's exactly, we were out, we'd be out nine months out of the year. That's a and lot. It's just, you know, cities like a Broadway show, seven shows a week. And uh, even though it was a kid's show, uh, we had all rock and roll roadies. Rolling mm -hmm. Stones and all yep. that stuff, and it was almost like a rock show for kids. Yeah, and it was just go go go. So yeah, it's a it's a it's survival. It's when survival. you're in the suit and you're like dancing and stuff like that, are you like, are you singing the songs and stuff so that it like gels with your manners, or are you just kind of in there just kind of doing the thing that you're doing? No, I have without going. I have to move the mouth, so I'm actually having. I'm like a full puppeteer, a full body. Got it suit puppeteer so it's right. pretty you know it's pretty yeah. intense especially yeah. when you're in something that's it's you know oh my god almost seven feet tall with the yeah. tall guy and then and then the weight behind it and and a tail that can knock people over so you can, yeah you got to be oh. blocking is super important right and especially <laughs> like could knock baby bop or bj over easy right there's uh, yeah when we did the tv show we would do what we called barney camp and we would bring all the kids in so they could see the costumes and meet us and do practice dances and teach them all that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, because obviously you can't have a kid looking for a tail or it's not going to look very natural. So, right. Yeah. You, you go through those kind of things. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's so really cool. What I'm, I'm just fascinated when you mentioned the pandemic. I mean, it sounds like you probably had to keep finding you were doing all kinds of stuff, I'm guessing. 
everything in this room. I was in this room for, uh, my wife said it was just like I was on tour, but I went to bed in the same bed with her. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't going to my, to my bunk. Um, I did uh, a lot of live streams from here. Um, I raised a bunch of money for charity, um, around $125,000 for uh, uh, different charities. And then um, I, uh, I, I did some shows for myself to keep the rent paid. And um, again, we did a bunch of Chuck E. Cheese stuff that, that I could do from home back then. Um, both my podcasts continued to go. We did, we learned how to do those remotely, which you know, just took about a week or so. Right. Um, managed to stay really busy actually. And, um, you know, I, uh, I wrote, uh, I wrote a solo country record that's coming out in the next few weeks. Oh, very cool. I wrote, yeah, I wrote a new Bowling for Soup album that uh, is coming out in April. Um, I, I, uh, I guested on more songs that I basically said yes to every, if any band asked me like, you want to sing on this? I'm like, sure, I'll sing on that. Which normally I'm like, no, I, I don't want to do that. And it's some, for some reason, COVID just opened me up to let's go, you know, but, uh, I just, I had to keep myself busy first couple of weeks of this, you know, I, you know, March, March of that year, we had a full calendar and I, for the first time in my life, started watching things come off the calendar instead of going on it. And it was full on panic. It wasn't the money. It wasn't the sickness. It was really just the anxiety of like, what am I doing? You know, like, cause I'm a calendar driven individual. It's like, even now it's like, okay, I know when the next time I go on tour is here's the amount of time I have to spend with my family or get done what I need to do. And then I'm on tour and then I come home and then repeat. Well, here was just this open ended thing of like, Hey, I don't think you're going anywhere for six months. Hey, I don't think you're going anywhere for a year. Hey, I don't think you're going anywhere for a year and a half. And uh, I just, wheels came off and I was just like, okay, then I'm going to do all this other stuff. And, and uh, I managed to, I managed to make it through, you know, I mean, obviously I know that we're, I don't want to talk about it as if it's past tense. Cause I know sure. that we're still obviously dealing with it. I actually have COVID right now. Um, oh my God. I, yeah. I I'm, I'm one day, one day before I get out actually. So, um, I'm when you when Eric goes, uh, hey, do you want to do this podcast? Yes, please. I'm looking for stuff to do. I'm locked in my upstairs um, and I have not I haven't seen anybody. You know, um, I, go, I go down and fill up my water and take my meds. That's it. Oh, my gosh. Um, but well, yeah, you're the first guest we've had that's had COVID. Or, or, I'm COVID. I'm I'm COVID. -y. I'm I'm your first COVID -y guest. But uh, like I said, downhill, I'm on the downhill slide. I get up. My drummer got out today. Uh, and then um, the, the rest of the band and crew, all, all, most of us have it, and uh, we're all getting out in, in different days this week. Well, because you have a show coming up. I do. Yeah, I got a show Saturday in Dallas uh, at the Kessler, and uh, we will be fine. I get out tomorrow, which is Wednesday. I don't know when you'll release this, yep. but uh, a little bit. Yeah, but... yeah I uh, I'll be out in time, and then uh, you know continue on. We we got uh, podcasts coming up, and. And I'm excited to see people, you know, my, my uh, I'm excited to see my father-in-law on Thanksgiving and watch some football with him. I've two weekends of watching football by myself is the weirdest thing in the world. <laughs> um, so I'm ready. Um, but yeah, man, I, uh, I, I, I'm vaccinated. So I don't know, you know, if you're watching this or listening, I don't know where you stand on that, but all I can say is that my case was very, very mild compared to a lot of things that I hear about. So I take that and do with it whatever you'd like. Well, I'm back. We're all vaccinated here as well. And, and I'm right with you. And this is a great example of that. So mm -hmm. I'm glad to glad to hear you're doing well. And yeah, I'm I'm with you a thousand percent. Doing good. My, my uh, I so I got the antibodies as well, because when I got COVID, I went and got so and then three months I can get my booster. And uh, I was texting with D Snyder from Twisted Sister the other day about something completely unrelated. Yeah. And he goes, he goes, oh yeah, I do that. He goes, I've done all that too. I get great 5G now. And I'm just like, yes, like we're, we're all radioactive. But uh, <laughs> I thought that that was a really funny way to look at it. it you, you almost have to laugh through this. I mean, we were all, I, I'm also a photographer mm -hmm. and I saw my calendar disappear as well. Uh, the March of, of, of COVID. Yeah. And, and as a creative, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, and I was, this podcast was going and we had to figure out this is, you know, zoom is, is ended up being a great thing and we sure. do all this stuff, but it, mm -hmm. everything was going and then it just kind of stopped. Yeah. It's, it's, um, 
you know, again, I think for people who, you know, being locked in the house is not for some people, you know, and, uh, you know, not interacting with people. And, and honestly, it, it sort of took me a minute. I don't know that I'm still over it. I mean, we've done a few things and we've done a couple of tours and things and I do all right, but there's definitely a time when it's like a little too many people for me and it has nothing to do with the illness at all. It, it just, I, my anxiety meter kind of starts to go and, and there I am. And so, I, you know, I think that that is definitely a direct result of just absolutely not being around anybody for so long. And maybe it's something that we get through, or maybe it's just something where I just have to change that particular behavior and not find myself in those situations, which is a little bit weird in what I, my career choice, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I, I'm, we're doing okay. You know, we're, uh, we're again, much better than some, my, my neighbor, uh, this is just a, a messed up story, but I feel like I should at least give it sure. airtime since we're talking about it. He, uh, he's a retired teacher. It's his first year to reti- for retiring from teaching. And uh, so everybody's doing their uh, first day of school picks. Well, he does his first day of school pick by his pool. And it's like the stereotypical, like his feet, you know, like, you know what I'm talking about? Like feet and a, a Corona or something. Mm-hmm. And uh, the next day he went into the hospital. This was the beginning of school back in August. He just got home last week. Mm-hmm. And this was, so again, man, we're, uh, we're very blessed here as far as, you know, how it's, how it's impacted us and hope the best for everybody. Absolutely. We are very blessed. And it, it's a, it's a shame. I mean, we got to the point, we, like I said, we got a 15 and 17 year old and we were almost waiting yeah, um, and seeing them go, you know, they did go back to school and wearing masks and all the things they had to do. And the social part was very difficult for them too, because all yeah. they're locked in their house. And now you're at school, but you all have to wear a mask. And yeah, it's yeah. There's a whole a whole class of kids that didn't get to go to prom, didn't get to walk the stage for graduation. I mean, you know, those are things. Despite how important that is in your past, at least you got to do it. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's it's bizarre. Very bizarre. Yeah, we, we've got a kid that's in uh, the marching band in, in uh, Keller High. And last year, they could play at the game, but they had to sit in the, in the field, basically on the, on outside the goal, uh, uh, the, the goal post and, you know, six feet apart and all of that. This year, they could actually do competition. Right. And, you know, the, it was just so great to see them being, and obviously everything's being safe, but right. You know, starting yeah. to get back is such a beautiful thing. 100%. Yeah. That's something that you, you know, those are the best times of my life. You know, it's, it's outside of Bowling for Soup is marching band. So I, I hate all the stories of them missing any of that because competitions, you know, despite I was the long haired kid and like the, you know, I was already like a rocker, but so I didn't care, but I did, you know? Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I really did. I really cared a lot, but I acted like I didn't. And uh, those are big, you know, those are big days, you know, and big camaraderie and good relationships. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I hope that they're getting to experience all that again. That's awesome. It's very cool. Let me ask you a couple more things. Um, one, we have a lot of people that watch this show that want to get into business. The, yeah. The puppeteers or actors or all these things. And you've got so many good lessons um, mm-hmm. from, from just trying things. Um, uh, I don't think no stops you. Not me. No, <laughs> I, uh, in fact, to me, the, the work, I, you know, to me, you know, again, I, I talked a little bit about my girlfriend, high school girlfriend's dad, and he was my mentor and I learned everything I know about most everything, you know, working on things around the house and, and, uh, business from him. And, you know, his, his theme is, it's all, it's the same with me. It's just, what's the worst that can happen? You know, like, I know a lot of people go by that. Well, you don't, you can't get a yes if you don't ask. But for me, it's like, what's the worst that's going to happen? Because so if they said no, and I just, I, I think I'm just going to do it anyway, you know, or, and, and, you know, obviously this, I'm not talking about breaking laws or anything. Right. I'm really just talking about motivation or like, you know, nothing's really going to stop me you know, from, if I decide, I, yeah, look, I told these guys, I told Bowling for Soup, 1996, we played this show in uh, Abilene, Texas. It was the first show we ever had where it was, everybody singing every word to every song. We'd never experienced that before. And it had been a good few months as far as like starting to figure out what was happening. 
and uh, we we had a dressing room. It was, uh, you know, it's not really a dressing room. It's like a makeshift thing in some conference house or something. And I just said, I think I have this figured out. Like, I think we can do this. And they're like, yeah, okay. And I'm like, but you just have to trust me and like do everything I say to do. And I think we can do it. And we did. And that's accurate. That's exactly what happened. And, you know, it took several years, you know, took uh, till 2003 before we could actually afford to pay rent, but heck we did it, you know? And so I think that's, you know, I think the main thing is, is you have to be driven. Um, you have to be persistent and, you know, this day and age, so much of it is just about relationships. So be around it, you know, as much as you can, you know, if you, you, like, as you said, I don't know much about the puppeteer world, but I do know that if you're not around other puppeteers, you're never going to get gigs. So be around it, just ask to help, you know, all of that stuff, volunteer to just move the puppets inside or whatever it is. And the same is true with, uh, with music, you know, if you want to be a musician, you need to go to shows and you need to meet bands and you need to meet artists and you need to develop friendships and meet club owners and bartenders and door guys and and merch people and, and all that. You got to develop those relationships so that you you can't get a gig at this particular spot until they need somebody and you're the person they think of. Right. You know? And so all of those things ring true, even with social media these days. You know, those things are all the same. And then there's the social media aspect of which you know, is sort of equivalent to what touring used to be for bands. You have to spend your day building your social media, building your streams. That's the new thing, you know, and then build out your crowds regionally if you're in a band. And voice acting, I, uh, I, I, you have to take a class, even if you don't think you need it, because you don't know this business, even if you think you do. And even if, even if you've lucked out on a couple of jobs, um, you don't know anything. You need to go take a class and, um, and then take another class and then take another class. And then what's, what that's doing too is also you're meeting people. You're, you're learning from what they're doing. You're learning from their mistakes. You're learning from their triumphs. And you just locked in a studio sending out random auditions. Um, it, it can work. I'm sure it can work, but it's not gonna. Um, so that would be 100% my advice for the voiceover thing is, is take a class and take another class and um, you know, do it. I love it. I love it. And one more thing. What's next? Oh, for me, um, yeah. like I said, uh, new. I, I got a new country album coming out. So you, everything I do, Jarrett Reddick, uh, dot com, Jarrett Reddick dot com, uh, J A R E T two one one three everywhere except TikTok. I'm just Jarrett Reddick. Um, Bowling for We'll put those links. We'll put all that stuff sure. out there for you too. Thank you. Bowling for soup dot com. A uh, new single is out now. It is not safe for work or your kids, but it is 100% pertinent to things that are going on in the world. So if you don't mind a little uh, adult language, by all means, listen to the new single called Kill Him With Kindness. And um, if, if, if you uh, would rather be more kid friendly, uh, go back to Getting Old Sucks and everybody's doing it because we actually have puppets uh, in our video. And um, yeah, touring and playing shows and podcasts, all that's at jarrettreddick.com and bowlingforsoup.com. And man, I just appreciate this conversation. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, thank you so much. I have just enjoyed, I haven't stopped smiling. I've enjoyed talking to you and hearing your stories. It's been so great having you on the show. Thank you, man. Well, I, I will come back anytime you need me, Carrie. Well, thank you. You say that. I'm going to call you. <laughs> hey, come on, do it. I, I learned very early not to put stuff into the world if you didn't want it to happen. So that's why I'd never ask anybody if they need help moving. <laughs> that's good advice. That's good advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, thank you so much, Jared. Hey, man. Thank you so much. And thank you for watching Purple Roads. Remember to keep your eyes, ears, and heart open, and you'll find your Purple Road. We'll see you next week.